Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Practical Liberty. My name's Henry Bingaman, and this is kind of a first on the podcast. Uh, I'm having one of my old clients, and not just any client, uh, Bob Keppel of Money Map Press, who has been had been my biggest client for many, many years. Bob, thanks for coming on. Hey, Henry. Great to be here. Um, and of course, it was, uh, yes, we had some very great years together at uh, Money Map, and we'll share some of those stories, but mo more importantly, share about how to you know, think about and how those businesses are are built, really. Yeah, it's the reason I wanted to have you on. Well, first of all, uh, we're both in Brian Kurtz's uh, previous guest uh, on the podcast, his mastermind, the Titans Accelerator, um, yes. and you did a presentation for that group, kind of about the the math of the of business math, basically. Uh, and I thought it was really insightful, not just for like business owners, who's a lot of the people in Brian's group are business owners, but for copywriters mm -hmm. and freelancers in general to understand the numbers in a business that you that that are the leverage points where you should be focusing. I, I don't know if you know. So I have a lot of uh, freelancers in my my, you know, I have the breaking free course that teaches people freelancing skills and less than half of the people in there are actually copywriters. A lot of people are data scientists. Um actual scientists, scientists, there's teachers, there's just a broad spectrum of people in there. And one of the things they always ask is like, well, what do I do in these companies? And it keeps coming back to, do you understand the numbers? Where can you apply your skills to increase different numbers in a business? So right, uh, right. that's why that, that's why it kind of excited me to have you on. And then you're also kind of making the transition to, um, you've retired from the the head honcho role and you're doing some consulting and now you're consulting for other people outside of, of just the money map area. So you're- Right. You're basically the sweet spot. You are both my audiences, the <laughs> entrepreneurial business side and the freelancer side. So absolutely. Well, I, I, I've, uh, I bought the course Breaking Free and it was very helpful in uh, as I started because it, it gave me the opportunity to to go through things and especially the um, the, the mobile money stack exercise, yeah. you know, to identify like the talents, the skills and the interests. So and to to get to your 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 question around sort of the numbers and what people need to understand, well, um, you know, when you look at a business, I always think there are two sides of it. One is especially a direct response business. One is sort of what's the positioning, you know, how how what are the messages that you deliver, to, you know, about your product? Um, what do you deliver in the marketing funnel? What is the copy literally? What does your customer service say? Because obviously that's doing everything to set up your your product. And, you know, what you change there, obviously, via copywriting and other things is huge because that that's, you know, that's what the customer sees. The other side is like the numbers that are going to help you, like, identify where those leverage points are. So, you know, some of the first questions that I always like to ask people are, you know, what, what are your economics of selling one unit right. you know, from from your cost and from how much revenue you bring in to what the actual product costs to what you spend on media, things like that. What does it cost to acquire a new customer, you know, uh, uh, to bring in a person? And what's your lifetime value? Because if you don't know those things, those sort of fundamentals kind of off the top of your head and have a good sense of those right away, it's going to be awfully hard for you to sort of make the right decisions around your, your business. Because ultimately, as you get into it, you're looking for like those, those one or two items that you can, you can tweak that are, or you can change. I don't want to say just tweak because if you can, if you can make significant changes there, you can double or triple your business inside of like you know one to three years. Right. And that, that, I think that's the goal for people is when you look at those those numbers is like how do you how do you find those spots um, to to push that kind of you know significant growth. I, I want to go back to a little bit more of your background because I want people like. You say the numbers, but there's a million numbers in every business. And you've kind there of, are. you've seen enough different industries and inside the direct response world mostly, um, but you've seen enough diff different industries to understand that, you know, in direct mail, the numbers are going to be a little different than, you know, when you're doing an online sales funnel. Um, right. So can you just kind of give your background and where you started in this? How do you got in this crazy world of direct response? <laughs> sure. Well, let me, let me try to make it um, kind of go through some of my own history, but also talk about the leverage points too. Um, because I sort of, I found my way into the direct response world after getting a history degree, which, you know, taught me, you know, critical, th you know, kind of a lot about critical thinking and use a lot of data sources. Mm -hmm. um, I think the both of which are helpful when you look, think about marketing messages and you think about how you, you know, support all the arguments that you want to make in, in your marketing copy. Um, and then I, I sort of, I found my way into like, direct response information publishing, 
um, which was this, you know, sort of the first time I was exposed, um, you know, to a, a world where there was kind of a fundamental distrust in institutions. <laughs> you had, I grew up in a very sort of traditional family. I was a first gen college kid. My parents didn't really question much of anything. Right. And so I, I, I started working with Rodale, who's this health and fitness you know, publisher and an alternative health publisher. And all of a sudden you have, you know, this sort of questioning of the establishment and this sort of fundamental, like, I don't trust my doctor. I don't trust. And, you know, that extends into what we did together. I don't trust the, my financial advisor. And it could be religion or it could be anything else. But there's this this um, this desire for people to like have some agency over what they do, over their own health, over their own money, over something else. And what they really, really want is guidance. Right. right. They, they don't they don't want to do it on their own. They want somebody, an expert to, to sort of carry them through it. So that's the world I've kind of been attracted. I've sort of got into and I've, I've really loved because it has that sort of marketing side, that positioning side I referenced. And then it has the numbers too, which I think of, you know, are always, it, 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 to me, is, I've always been intriguing. So, you know, at a business like Rodale, which was this, uh, which was a, a very mission-oriented health and fitness pub publisher, you know, the, the economics at the time, uh, this is back in the 90s when I first started, you know, it's like we were selling books for $35 or $40 a piece right. you know, in revenue, and the printing costs were only like three to five bucks. So your know, gross margin wise, we were at 90%. Like that's fantastic. And then we had this amazing hit product called the doctor's book of home remedies. Mm -hmm. I think in about four or five years span, we sold something like 18 million copies. But what was more, the only way we did that is because it opened our eyes up to all the available media sources mm -hmm. and really, you know, for the first time brought out like huge acquisition opportunities and made us go back and look at the numbers and really break it down to say like, what is the, you know, what, what is the amount we can spend per order on a TV station in Tulsa, Oklahoma? <laughs> right. We were literally getting it down to that level of, of detail. And so I think that, you know, it's the scale came all, all came from being able to, to approach those media and know exactly what we can spend. Um, and usually the biggest factor there is going to be your advertising cost. Right. You know, what, what, what is it there and how can you either negotiate that or bring it down back then you could really negotiate a little more than you probably can now. Um, but it was, it was that, it was that factor that made the biggest difference and allowed all that media to open up and helped us grow like a, a 300, I think through $350 million business at the peak of it. So how do you parse those numbers between like, oh, what's the difference in the, you know, Philadelphia market versus the Tulsa market versus the, I mean, what's the, what level of granularity can you get to, especially this was before like big data, you know, quantum <laughs> yes. computers or whatever That's people true. are doing there was No, I mean, yeah, it was, I, I was, I was doing it off of, you know, uh, fax records from our media, media buying agency <laughs> and mapping that out against what, like the, the, the the order volume and the refund rate that we had or the return rate that we had on the books. So, you know, there was, there was some, so there was math. It was, it was not that hard math. Yeah. It was, it was all sure. done doable, very easily doable on Excel. It took a little more grinding work than it does now. Um, but I think it's the, you know, kind of the, you're, you're ultimately going with your, what's your advertising costs against the revenue that you're bringing in. Right. And certainly in most direct response, businesses, you have to be willing to spend more than you're bringing in to mm -hmm. get to significant scale. So you know, if I if I spend $100 on media, usually I'm only going to bring in maybe 70, maybe 80, maybe even 60 bucks, depending if, on I, what I know my lifetime value is. So I, I think that's the biggest lesson is you can't, if you want to scale a business, if you want to grow something large, you can't be at that 100 to 100 ratio. You have to have enough faith that you're going to sell those customers further products down the road and bring in more revenue to more than make up for that cost. Yeah, I think this, there's, a, there's a difference between the um, so I just had last week I had Jason Stapleton on and he was talking about entrepreneurial minimalism. And it's basically he focuses entirely on time, freedom and mo mobile income, basically. So the freedom right. aspect of it. And I think there is a case where you can do the the 100 uh, percent ROI on some campaigns to bring in names there. 
um, right, at, right. without really focusing on the long term. But you're you're right. You're talking about scale. You're never going to break 10 million, uh, not nine figures, certainly not going to get 100 million without going into the hole. And I think a lot of people don't realize the advertisers are hoping for a 60, 70 percent ROI on their initial media spend. Yes. Um, it's, I, I think relative to what Jason said last week, because I, I listened and he was excellent. I mean, I think the if you're an entrepreneur and you want to keep your costs under control, you can you can run it right. You can run it 100, 100. You can run it to 90. You can run it to whatever level you like um, and, and and sort of manage that side of the business. If you're a freelancer and you want to create your own personal scale, you want to you have to find a client who has some ambition yeah. and who has that that desire to scale their business. Because if they if they don't, don't have that ambition, then your personal return from it is going to be limited. Um, I think, you know, obviously for the for the two of us, you know, the the scale that we achieve um, in those years at Money Map led to, you know, I'm sure the highest earning years of our lives probably, yeah. right? Where, you know, the 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 numbers were tremendous, the profits were tremendous, what we were getting paid is sort of, leading people in that organization were tremendous. So yeah, and I'll talk a little more about that later. It's like, you have to recognize in a client what their ambitions are and what kind of scale they're you know working towards and help them achieve it. Yeah. Um, because that that's what's gonna give you the, ultimately the the the, the money level and the freedom economically to, to be, I think to be most successful. Um, and I would say at Money Map, I think the biggest change was you know, had to do with when we we figured out like cart value, um, <laughs> and you know, because it's we, there was always like a, this kind of we were growing, and there was this kind of incredible core team of ten to fifteen people with amazing ideas and and great product development, and Mike Ward, and you know, and the, and then you're you know you're you've mentioned Jed Candy as your man your mentor, and Jed was, you know, Jed and then and Brett Holmes from the media side like started figuring out like well. Okay, if if our dollar value for an average order from Facebook or Google is a hundred dollars, and and you know, you know, we can only spend, afford to spend one hundred twenty, but if we can get up to like one hundred fifty or one hundred sixty, then we can afford to spend two hundred. Right. And it it opened when so they they laser focus and all credit to you know Jed he he was tight on the numbers so it was Brett you know they they focused on like getting those numbers up through different offers in the marketing funnel. And by doing so, you know, it, it opened up this entire, you know, a, entire landscape of media again that allowed us to to bring in, you know, 70, 100, 125,000, you know, people from a campaign. Like you were, you worked on the, the National Institute for Cannabis Investors. You know, that was yeah, a huge. That was, a huge my, one of my biggest, actually, I think that was my biggest financial uh, promo that I ever wrote. And, right. And it was, you know, and, and it was all thanks to figuring out the economics of it, that if, if you can capture more value from the customer up front mm -hmm. in that in that card value process in the initial order, then you can you can sort of spend a little more and you can bring more people in. So it's it's it, those are the kind of economic questions uh, that you want to be answering. And you know, again, it, it's a I mean, it, this is this is a little outside of the direct response realm, but in contrast, I worked at I worked at AOL for a couple of years, and I was there right after kind of right towards the the zenith. Um, right after the AOL Time Warner merger, and they all hated each other, and it was not a great environment. But um, the AOL business itself was producing a billion dollars in free cash flow per month, <laughs> and the it was all ha it was all it, it only worked because they were charging people twenty four bucks a month for access, and they were only paying eight dollars out to the phone companies for you know the dial up connections. But as soon as high, you know, so they were. That entire business was built on that, that those numbers, that equation. But as soon as, you know, sort of broadband internet came around, uh, all of a sudden they were charging 50 bucks a month, but they were paying the, you know, the providers 48. It's like that entire margin went away. So it's like, you can't, I mean, and that's, that's another reason I'm fond of a direct response business, because if you have, you're able to establish a relationship with people you have leverage and you have so you have to have some more leverage and pricing power versus just being something like a commodity. So I'm curious because you we were talking about lifetime value and it's it mm -hmm. and then the the kind of business model thing. So how do you calculate lifetime value from a perspective that makes sense? Because it's going to be different for every business because yeah. you 
I don't want to calculate a 10 year lifetime value of a customer right now and then have to right. say, OK, well, I can spend two thousand dollars because over the course of 10 years, they're going to spend, you know, two thousand and five dollars with me. That, that that economics doesn't work out. Right. Um, right. And I, I remember I had a client that was doing heavy media buys and they would calculate their day zero LTV. I don't know why they called it LTV, but it was day zero, day 10, day 30, day 60, day 90, right. day 180. So they were. Yes. And then they they would find the break even point. I think they like to be at like uh, day 60 or day 30 break even day 60 profitable. Yeah, that's a that's a common practice. I mean, and usually most people that you you work with and you know, most businesses that do scale, they they want it back. They want the money back within 90 days. Yeah. So. So you have to have the pro you have to have sort of the products and the subsequent marketing in order to do that and to make it happen. Um, it's funny because you you brought that up because I'm having a uh, a client I'm working with now. They have a their business model. It sort of gives them this huge opportunity for upside from their customers about anywhere from three to seven years out. <laughs> and we're Man. we're like comparing that to well, what if we move some more of that money into the first, you know, the initial relationship into those first three, six, nine, 12 months, you know, and, and going through the financial stuff now. And it's like, well, okay, if you, you know, if you, even at that good sort of high upside, if you, you discount it and you do net present value and whatever else, like, well, it might really be better to have the cash. <laughs> it right. might be better to have the cash in hand. Yeah. There's, it's scary sometimes going to like, even when people start scaling a, a campaign, so you, you get a promo that really works on the networks and you say, OK, you know, we were getting this at 80 percent. Let's scale it back to 60 percent. And all of a sudden you spend a million dollars at 60 percent and something changes in your funnel where the numbers don't back out. Like there's a right. lot of, of scary things that can change in a funnel. There are there are very much. And I think that's the other you know piece you were you talking about how your clients were calculating, you know, that 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 value you know, you're they're doing that down to the media source down to the spend whatever else and yeah. you, know, you really should be tweaking your what you're willing to pay by those different levels i mean it, it's one of the reasons and we can talk about like what you kind of team you need but one of those things is a good is a good media operator you know people who can who can do that who know that math and who can sort of tweak those things um and then again you, but you, you gotta have to you have to track the that lifetime value quickly and make sure you get the get good offers in front of those people to drive up that number. Yeah. So for the the freelancers, I always say just I, I always try to teach people how close can you get to increasing lifetime value of a customer in one way or another. So that can be actually bringing down costs because that can increase the it I guess doesn't increase the lifetime value, but it increases the amount of money you can spend uh to bring in new customers. That's how close can you get to increasing the business's bottom line? So what I guess over your experience uh, through multiple different businesses from like AOL through money map, through uh, some of the, the direct mail campaigns, what are the most important numbers that a freelancer you think could come in and focus on? Well, I think if it's a, if it's a freelancer who can, um, uh, who's coming in to write, to write copy um, to me, I think that the biggest piece is thinking about that entire marketing funnel. Mm -hmm. um, and you back to that cart value example from money map, it's, you know, Jed and you and whoever who was working with him on a project, you know, you guys would team up and you'd not write, not just write the promotion. You would make sure the order form was amazing. You would make sure the, the, uh, the product lifetime upsell was amazing. And then there'd be two or three other levels beyond that. And we'd spend put, as, as much time in the rest of the funnel as we did the main copy typically. Right. Right. And, and that's, that's where by doing it, you know, at that level and making sure that all those things are high quality, it may, it makes a huge difference. I mean, nothing as a, as a client working with a, a freelancer um, and, and even very good freelancers, nothing would drive you, you know, drive me crazier than somebody saying, oh, well, I'm going to have my, my junior write the order form. Like, <laughs> right. Wait a minute. You, you just, you just spent all this time and all this effort crafting a very particular, you know, 60 minute, VSL and everything else. And then you got somebody to the point of, oh, I'm ready. I'm just about ready to buy. And then you say, oh, no, well, I'm just going to let this guy write the, this other person write the copy. Right. <laughs> He's not nearly as good. So that that is, I mean, it, one way to think about the numbers is that if you, if you go through, think of a, a typical marketing funnel, like you get somebody to click on an ad, 
then they go they might have to go to another advertorial page or something like that and then they go to the the main promotion itself and then they go to an order form and then they, any offers afterward you know any any point in there that you can improve by 20% is going to give you should give you 20% more at the bottom line um, and i think the ease to me the easiest both the easiest and hardest thing to get right there to tweak there is the order form uh, because you have, you know, you, you built enough desire for somebody to go through from the actual you know, main copy itself into the order form and into the offer. Um, and you can you can test those with with relative ease. But it's also it's a hard number to move. But if it does, if you can move it, it's it's huge. I have seen. Yeah. I mean, I, I've seen the dumbest order forms win, but it comes from testing like an order form that right. you, you think I, I had a client a long time ago that used they had a mobile optimized. It wasn't a long time. It was a couple of years ago. They had a mobile optimized funnel. Right. So it was this mobile optimized sales page and scrolling thing with little video elements. But it was all for like scrolling on your phone. And then the, right. the order form that converted at 70 percent was a desktop optimized one. The mobile optimized didn't convert. They had to go to this weird, like you have to scroll in and out to make it work desktop order form. But like, it's just testing. They couldn't right. get anything to beat that order form. So they kept using it. That's um, true. That's and true. It, it's a, there's so much weird stuff out there. I wonder for, I have a lot of people in data analytics and big data. I wonder how much they could take the numbers and kind of crunch that down and find the biggest leverage points. Like where, if they, you know, regression analysis or whatever, what is the thing we could do that would move this the most? There's probably some opportunities for freelancing in there. If you can tell somebody yeah, where to people, optimize a funnel. Right. If I would tell people where to optimize the funnel, um, I would say it is in the, the, the biggest point is probably in that order value mm -hmm. um, because you, it, it is testable. Um, you can, you can change things around. Uh, media costs are much harder to control. You know, you, you can, you can get people who can do it and, and do targeting well. Um, but I would say it, you know, that 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 piece of the that sort of order value is the biggest because again, I think you know, if, if you have a, a product that is at all reasonably distinctive, um you can you can drive price upwards yeah. in a in a in a direct response business because you're having a one-on-one -on -one relationship. You know, it's like when I go buy on I, no, I think the last thing I bought at Amazon was like a pickleball net. What is pickleball? What is, <laughs> what is pickleball? Yeah. What is pickleball? Oh my gosh. I mean, you, you do live in, in the woods, don't you? I do. Um, it's, it's, anyway, it's, it's, we'd have to get into what it is, but you know, <laughs> I bought this because all these, there are all these courts around us, but they don't, none of them have nets. So it's like, if you want to play, you have to like, you know, bring your own net. But as I bought off Amazon, I have no idea what the company was, the name was. I like right. looked at it. I looked at the reviews, whatever else. I have zero relationship with that. So you know, the Amazon may be screwing with the pricing behind the scenes, mm -hmm. but I, I don't, you know, that's so deep. I, I can't, I can't change that. But if I'm a, an entrepreneur with a product or if I'm a freelancer coming in looking at the product, if I tell you, if I, if I figure out a way to increase your price by 25%, yeah, that could really change your business. Um, and that's, that's the thing. I think people underestimate how much they charge for things. You know, if, if you've got an info product or something and you're getting two ninety nine dollars for it, Try four ninety nine, you know, and it, and if you're getting four ninety nine, try seven ninety nine, because uh, you odds are you may come out ahead in those dynamics if the desire is high enough. Yeah, it's really interesting because you have to listen to the math, not the complainers. <laughs> like you'll get right. a lot of people who are just upset at the price and they'll say it's outrageous and you're charging way too mm -hmm. much. But at the end of the day, the customers that buy love it as long as they love it, as long as you're not you're like charging $900 and selling them a, a two page ebook, right? There's, there's some right. level of outrage right. where you, you can't go beyond, you have to deliver enough value, but value is such a subjective thing that some people will think, you know, Oh, I, you know, my freelancer course sells for seven ninety five. Some people have told me that's absurd. And some people have told me, you know, I just had somebody tell me they landed a $50,000 client for a two month retainer. It's like, right. okay, so that worked out really well. Um, so <laughs> exactly. it's, you know, there's a lot of uh, of wiggle room in a price because price is so subjective to the person, sure. the situation, the value is it's all there. So, yeah. Right. But the math always tells you the truth. Like it, the market will tell you if the price isn't working, if if you double the price to, to eight hundred dollars or something and it stops selling, <laughs> then your math told you your value is not there. That's right. And so much of what you just described is 
is audience psychology. And yeah. that's that's part of the, you know, it's definitely part of the fun of of working in, you know, in a, in a business like this is how, you know, how how's that positioning? How are those messages delivered? And what are they saying to people? And when you get to the offer, are you conveying enough value to someone that they're going to be willing to pay that price? Right. You know, can they can they see can they see, you know, to to not just earning that money back, but multiplying it many, uh, many times beyond. So, so for instance, I'm sure that person who just got the $50,000, you know, two month contract, uh, you're going to ask them for a testimonial for, <laughs> you <bet. laughs> for your course, right? Just makes, it just makes sense. Um, you know, we all, we all do those things to, to show that, okay, there's, there's much more potential here because you're learning something and you're going to be able to expand it into like a, a real, a real change in your life. Which is ultimately what most people who, who buy these products want. Yeah, well, especially coming out of the financial world, it, it, business and financial is so easy to communicate value on that the prices can be astronomically high. Like an investing product, you can sell for two thousand dollars because you can easily show that two winning investments make that back. Um, right, right. It's a little harder in some of these other, like the health realm. It's just hard to sell a a weight loss product, let's say for more than like 50 bucks, it's, even if it's a DVD right. and a book and a customized eating program, you know, you just can't say, well, you're going to lose 50 pounds. And therefore this 50 bucks, that's a dollar a pound. It just, the math doesn't work <laughs> that way. And somebody said, no. and there's so much, comp there's so much competition there at so many different yeah. levels, you know, with, um, with weight loss. In fact, uh, you know, you like the only the comparison you probably want to make today is that, you know, Ozempic is going to cost you 800 bucks a month. <laughs> you want to go off and try that versus this fifty dollars product, uh, but it, but right, it, it's it's health health information is so abundant and so um, well, maybe the, probably not all trustworthy by any means, but uh, so available on the internet that it, it's hard to maintain any kind of pricing leverage. It's interesting. Supplements are the best. Uh, supplements are where all health companies end up making their money essentially. Um, because mm -hmm. that's where your margins are. If they trust you, if you once you get them to that initial stage of trust, then they're going to buy a six month package of supplements from you, um, right. and, and they might re up three times before they're you know done with it or moved on right. to the next thing. Sure, because yeah, if you get fifty bucks for each of those supplement shipments, and that's hundred fifty dollars, your cost of product is probably ten. Right. It's it's one of those things though. You just have to understand the math and these. It goes back to the numbers. You have to understand yes. each yes. individual business's business model. What numbers matter to them? Right, right. And kind of circling back to your question about, you know, data analytics and for people who specialize in that field or you know, if, if you work, you know, work with your marketing team and figure out where, you know, where is the process falling down? Mm -hmm. You know, is it is it literally the the first step that they can't even get their advertising to work? Right. You know, that you can't you can't get started there. Is it at the level of they can't you can't capture the orders? You know, you're, you're getting people to the offer itself, and then only one percent are converting. Now, I, I think those are the things you want to you let you can point out to them. And the nice thing about numbers is you can you can take a spot and say, okay, if, if we change our order form from a one percent conversion to a two percent conversion, uh, well, look all this. Look at how everything else starts to work. Right. You know, the the entire entire business begins to open up. It's amazing on some of those little leverage points. Like if you get the ad from 1% click through to 2%, you've at the same cost, you've changed everything. You've literally right, changed right. the math of the entire formula. And it sounds like 1%, but it's 100% change. That's true. That's true. Yeah, you got twice as many eyeballs are looking at the next step. And I think that's it. If you, you know, if you, if you don't know where to start, the, you know, the easiest, generally the easiest things and the fastest things to change are the the ads themselves, and then ultimately the the conversion piece. Yeah, because um, it's often harder to change the actual. Let's say if it's a promotion of some sort that takes it takes more thinking, more writing. You may have to change your product, everything like that. That takes time, um, but you can you can always go in and, and tweak your your ads or test new ideas and test new offers and things like that. Quite you know quite easily. It's funny. I did this. Uh, it was a tweet the other day, and it was a, a barroom conversation I had with Mark Ford back probably in two thousand nine or ten, uh, down at at the in um, Florida, right. and he he had told me, and I've kind of looked at this. It's not exactly right, but he his uh, formula was eighty twenty, or yeah, eighty. <laughs> sorry, I'm going to screw it up. Eighty fifteen five. So eighty percent of your business should be things that you know work, and you just 
focus in on that. And that's the main thing. 15% should be testing things, not like testing wild, crazy ideas, but like variations on headlines, different mailing types. Cause this was, he was talking about building Agora. So different right. um, envelope types, different like Magalog versus eight page letter. Cause you never know which one's actually going to win. And then 5% should be crazy off the wall, big ideas, but it all comes down to that. It's all numbers. And I, I said in practice his early days, just watching him, he was more like 90 percent he knew what worked 80 percent testing and two percent crazy ideas right, right. Had that many crazy <laughs> ideas but the, the principle holds it's it's just business math right so yeah. there was something interesting interesting you said a while ago uh that every business is a funnel right 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 so, i mean every yeah every every i mean one of the it, one of the things i try to, to get people to think about is that like every business is a funnel every page or, or thing that you put in front of them is a is an offer and every click is a choice because mm -hmm. we're so you know we are so overloaded now with various pieces of information coming at you um that it, it's obviously hard to get people's attention and you have to sort of keep them in that flow step by step by step so you you know you really do need to go you, it's every element of it matters and every piece um has you know has an impact if you can change it uh in fact you know some one of the other things i, I show to people and you you have to you know it can be uh can be offensive if you don't like <laughs> if people don't like how they like it but uh if you go back to like the alec the famous alec baldwin speech in glenn gary glenn ross yeah um and, and all anybody remembers from that is like always be closing right abc mm -hmm. always be closing and it's a which is true, but you know if, if you if you go and if you go back and watch that scene again, when he goes to his board and says always be closing, he also puts up um, there's also AIDA, mm -hmm. which is like attention, interest, decision, action. I to me it's more desire action yeah. is the D, but you know if you can't think of it this way, we're tying it back to what we were just talking about. If you can't even get somebody at the top of the funnel. Like you can't get their attention like that. That's one thing. And you can't, yeah. you can't get even get any interest going. And if you're at down at that order form level, you can't get the action, you know? So, the, so that's the piece you're working at. And, and that, that AIDA is, is a great representation of like audience psychology. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so think about where you need to attack in your own business based on some of that. If I'm top of the funnel, I'm just trying to get attention and interest. If I'm down at that that offer level at the cart value level, I'm trying to provoke action. And you you do both differently, you know, accordingly. All right. So we have a lot of freelancers, obviously, on my list and that listen to the podcast. Um, but we have some clients too. And you're kind of you've been on both sides now. So what should what do you think clients look for specifically in freelancers and vice versa? What should freelancers look like or look for in their clients? Right, right. So, you know, and yes, I've been fortunate to be on both sides. You know, for so if you're a freelancer, um, you know, what a client looks for in you, I'd say the first thing is to just sort of show up and deliver. Uh, you're, you know, as, as as I think as you point out in your course, Henry, the um, you know, you're you're sort of giving them time, money, or convenience. That's what you're providing, mm -hmm. right? And and so that's their their fundamental expectation is going to be that you you are doing what you you know that base level of, of what you you know the the agreement is the second is to actually provide solutions for them um to not be asking them kind of you know yeah. to, to, to sort of frame everything out for you um i know you, you know, we worked together on a a um, a promotion and you actually cited in one of your posts where the entire idea got you know killed like two days in advance yeah. of the we were, when we were supposed to launch it. Well, it was and in recording. I, we're, I, we, we were going to recording and there was a press release that they were killing. It was about the, the battery just division of a company. And I'd written right, this entire right. promo about this giant yes. new battery that was going to change energy storage. And the technology is still amazing. It's just on the shelf in this company. They just killed the division and went in a different right. direction. They did. They did. And I, I was the client on the other side. And you were extremely responsive and didn't, you know, you didn't cry, sort of cry over the spilled milk. You came right back and said, wait a minute, there was this other interesting piece about this company that we could write about. And 
quickly rewrote it and and you know delivered and and that was providing a solution. Right. So it wasn't you know that you no know, throwing up your hands and saying like, well forget it we can't we can't do this Let, let's work creatively and do something and that that level of sort of initiative is huge um, because even you know and then of course you're going to be expected to deliver results you know, sure. that's that's sort of the basis of the ongoing relationship but if you have that the that dynamic of of things you're going to be a you know you're going to be high up on their list of the the people they want to work with. And then finally, it is to pick up on some of the things that we talked about today, which is knowing the numbers, you know, and helping them find where their leverage is. Because certainly the, uh, you know, had the good fortune over the years of working with some amazing copywriters and, you know, the, the Gary Ben Savangas, the Clayton Make pieces, the Jed Cannies of the world, you, you know, and it's like all of you thought about the, you know, thought about things more than just like this little piece of copy I'm writing. Yeah. You thought about the entire customer experience and and where those leverage points were, were. and that makes you more of a partner, not just like a, a freelancer. Yeah, I think it's you're thinking about what's best for the business. It's not literally how can I write this copy. It's how can I grow their business for them. Like, what's the best thing right. that I can do for this company, this client as a whole? They're hiring me to do a specific job, but what they really want is this big picture growth or convenience or like the more you take off their plate or the more money you make them. The better, the the more holistic, holistically, I guess you approach the business. The better off you're going to be as a freelancer. Don't limit yourself exactly. to just the one skill that you have that you're selling them. It's what's the totality of value you can bring to that client and maximize that. And a client will never let you go. Yes, yes. Now that that's very true. And I think the flip side of that to to answer your original question is like what you want to look for in a client if you're a freelancer. I do think you want you want to see some ambition, right? You want to, you want to see someone who has plans in mind that are going to help them grow um, because mm -hmm. the you, the best clients help best clients also help make you better yeah. right you know, if, if you're if you if you go into a room and you're the smartest person that client might give you enough money to to maybe sort of get by in, in a lifestyle business um, but if you are if your ambition is to do more to make significant amounts of money you need clients who challenge you, who help make you better, who enhance your ideas, who have the the tools to to get it out to a wide audience and things like that. And I mean that that's that kind of scale is ultimately going to be more valuable for you than somebody who where you know everything, you know more than everything, more <laughs> than them on everything. <laughs> and th there's this, there's a limited ceiling there. Yeah, you're not going to grow with a client where you know more than them, or where you can do everything yourself. Uh, you're right. gonna your income is gonna grow. You're gonna get better at your job, at your freelancing skill by working with people that are clients that are growing. And I know we talk about like the lifestyle business thing. It's not bad. That's a perfectly fine option. Right. But it's it's not for everybody. Like, can you imagine Jed Canty being satisfied with like just having a you know <laughs> chugging along type thing, or Mike Ward, right. or any of the people that we've worked with over the years? There's like there's a personality type that is growth, 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 and. Right. It's fun to attach to those people as a freelancer, especially as a freelancer, because you get to back up and like say, "All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna chill out now. You go ahead and grow." But you get but, to watch, right? You get to watch and learn, and you know, and it's like, um, and I know this came up last week with Jason Stapleton. It's like scale is hard work. You know, it is, mm -hmm. it is incredibly difficult. It's also incredibly exhilarating. You know, when yeah. when you can reach it, there is a feeling and a. And a and a vibe about like when you're in a growing business yeah. that makes everything makes makes the effort feel worthwhile. Um, it, it also comes with those feelings of responsibility and stress that that Jason pointed out. Uh, but if you can if you can balance the two and get it, it's it can be a lot of fun. It can be, and it, you know, there's uh, different times in your life for different things. So maybe in your when you're just starting out, you want to be part of that growth, and then when you're 50, you want to go into more of a lifestyle business. Um, or right. vice versa. Maybe you, you're kind of like just into chilling out when you're young and then all of a sudden you get bit by a you know ambition bug at 50 and you want to build. I think the average yeah. age of a, a successful entrepreneur when they start is something like 40. And that's like the median age, 45 or something. So it's not too late for most people. There's plenty of entrepreneurs that start in their 50s and 60s. So that's you can true. get into the growth mindset at any time. But yeah, just, uh, you know, whatever's right for you at the moment you, is there's, there's nothing, nothing wrong with scaling. It can be fun. It's a lot of work. Um, right. but it's, you know, being part of something is cool. That's right. If you, yeah, if you have the, if you have the passion for it and you're excited about it, then it, then it is cool. Then it's worth the effort. If you could build, and then you can, you know, you can build a team, you can really create something. There is a, it's a, it's like I said, it's a, it's a feeling of exhilaration. 
So this is kind of an interesting because now you're doing consulting for companies. So if you're coming into a company, um, how do how do you start breaking things down? Like where do you start? Somebody hires you, consult for them. They're like, right. I don't know, we're we're making ten million dollars a year in this direct response type world, um, but we're like frustrated. We feel stuck. Where do you start analyzing that company? We start analyzing the company. I think there. Um, I always go back. You know, I go back at two levels. One one is like, what's the what's the sort of product marketing co- sort of content level? What's the relationship level? And how is everything positioned there? Um, and what can, you know, because the things that would result out of that are often what sort of different products should you be bringing out? How can you be additive to the business? How can you create things that are going to extend your lifetime value for those people? And then the place I start for the the numbers I, I kind of mentioned earlier, which is I want to see your breakdown on what your what your unit cost is, what your acquisition cost is. And again, not just cost, but the the whole thing. You know, what what do your ads cost? What kind of click rate are you getting? Right. What do you, you know, how many people are going to go into your promotion page? How many people are going from the promotion page to the offer? Breaking it down to that level. And then what's your lifetime value consist of? Because if, if you start there, it's enough detail to begin to figure out some of the patterns and determine what level of um, what level the business needs the most attention. Uh, it, it, so that that's why I like to start with people. And then again, it, it all comes back to those those leverage points where where in your business is the the highest leverage point? Because if you let's I mean, let's say you're a you know, you are a, a, a business where there's a much higher cost of goods. You know, you, you can't you, you have to, to make sure you, you close those sales up high um, in order to make up for that cost. Versus, you know, a book or an information product or a supplement where, you know, your cost is really going to be at the advertising level. Right. Um, it's not going to be in the actual product content itself. So where do you think? So it just occurs to me because I've seen a lot of this where somebody will have a physical product and they they they're getting it, it has to be made in the U.S. It's like some, I forget, like Doodle, some I don't know g- gadget we'll call it, and then they add on information so they they can sell those things but they have a very like limited profit margin they can make. Maybe it's like a knife and they can sell it for 10 bucks, but their cost of goods is nine bucks. And then they add an information product, like a survival thing on top of that, that sells for 49 bucks, but is entirely profit. Like you can play around with the numbers that way. If you, if you you look at the business as a whole, you can say, okay, this, this isn't the product I'm selling. This is my lead gen then. Right. Right. And that's true. It, It can work that way. And, and I think when it comes to those sort of additive offers, the, the, phrase that always comes in my mind is just give them more of the same yeah. Uh, because the, the survival course on top of the knife is playing on the audience psychology of it. You know, it's like, what's the, how can I get, you know, how can I tech a little deeper into their psyche and say, here's how you're going to use the knife, you know? Yeah. And if, and if you can, and honestly, if you can have something that's, not just just that one way to use the knife. And if you if there's another application that you can get that, you know, you can have a second thing or a third thing, you can just keep raising that pricing level up further and further. Yeah. Because um, it's I it's funny that one of the most successful front ends we ever had at Money Map it was for an energy uh related product and it was about solar energy. This is back, I don't know, 2016 maybe. And I remember like all it. the audience groups liked it and I mean, we had no idea this thing was, I don't know, it sold 70,000 units or something. We had no idea it was going to be like that. And and every, you know, every report that we had in there was related to solar, like doing solar on your house, how there are solar cars coming out, how you could do solar windows, how you could do whatever. And it's like, I'm, I'm convinced that part of it was just opening it up beyond the sheer, we we're going to invest in this stock and this yeah. like whole world that was going to, uh, you know, uh, revolve around you. And I think that helped our conversion a lot. Yeah, the offer them more of the same is somewhat counterintuitive, but it's amazing how consistent it is in every business. If, <laughs> That's right. If, if you just sold them a knife, try to sell them a set of knives is actually the best next offer. Yes, yes, very, very much. So. I've never, yeah, I've never been in a business where that's failed. And usually when you try to test against it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. So I'm curious when you step into a business, because is the problem, if people are, let's say they're shrinking or they're, they're having problems growing, it's 
is the problem more math where they just don't they're not looking at the numbers right or is the problem kind of on the creative side where they're not sure where to go next uh it i mean it's going to vary by client i mean usually if you're um if it if it's somebody who who has been on a growth tra tra trajectory and wants to ask the question of like what do i do to go from 5 to 10 or 10 to 20 or something like that a lot of it usually is math and how you can expand that if it's something where it's it's been plateaued or on the decline um usually it's going to be you know more about the product and oftentimes about the people yeah. um because you know if you if you want to um if you want to have some scale, you have to have more than it has to be more than just you, you know, even <laughs> uh, even just the because I, I think there are four. I think there are sort of four key roles within any like successful larger business. One is you've got to have somebody who's kind of a product leader who knows the who understands the audience and how to put together a product that's going to deliver value to people. Uh, I think you need an idea leader who is someone that the kind of has that creativity who can do the the five percent that you talked about you know yep. with um <clears throat> with with mark for but even even the, the other 15 percent you know they they're, they gotta they have to drive the 20 percent besides what just works and then the, the a marketing leader who's somebody who, who, got, who gets the economics of things and who can do more of the the day-to-day -day monitoring the business and then finally sort of a, a good operator and a good operator is somebody who is who has the capability of going into uh you know the media side and tweaking what's happening on Facebook or Google or knows people or works with people who can and who understands the systems and how to tweak offers and change things and can just keep that testing going on at a rapid pace. Um so if you're even if you're just a small entrepreneur and you've got you know it's you and one other person or whatever. I think it's a good exercise to ask yourself the question of which roles, which of those roles do you fulfill well? Yeah. And which of those, where do you know, where do you need help in those other roles to sort of build a more complete team to help you expand, expand a business? Um, I, was, I was just thinking that it's kind of, there is nobody that builds a, you know, eight figure business alone. Like there, I just, I've never heard of it. There yeah. might be somebody that has a one-off product that they sell on ClickBank or something that takes off and, you know, they sure. got the, the truth about abs, but if you want to keep that going and turn it into, you need more products, you need more people. So yes, you, yeah. I think uh, one of the mistakes I see a lot of entrepreneurs make is they hire somebody or they partner with somebody that's almost exactly the same as them. And then they're, right. they're butting heads and there's no growth there at all. They just get stuck in that, that position because you, if you have any divergence of vision at that point and you both have the same skills, you're at an impasse, you need to split right. the company up. So finding so what was your product ideas marketing and operations right now yes in a smaller company you might have somebody the idea and the marketing and somebody's the product and operations right it doesn't have to be right right and it's, it's i wouldn't say i don't like to call it operations because you it, the person has to be more than that they have i, I sure. like to use the term operator okay. because they are they're like really detailed and they're really hands-on but they also have complete awareness in the numbers they're not they're not just pushing buttons you know they, they know they know how to how to sort of control media, do things like that. And it's, I mean, if, if it's just you and you need one other person, um, I would go for the operator first because they could take a lot of the creativity and vision that you may have and implement it in ways that you can't even imagine or you don't know how to do right. without, without you. And then you don't have to go out and hire like four or five ag you know, agencies or freelancers or whatever else to do it. Like getting a good operator on your team is, can be worth its, can be worth its weight in gold. Yeah. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's kind of like the operator is the engine at the executive level, right? They keep everything moving. They're not necessarily yeah. steering, but they're right, keeping right. everything moving forward, which is, you know, what's the point of steering if you don't have any power behind it? So right, right. that's it, true. That's true. It's an incredibly yeah. important position. I feel you know, like I feel it myself. Like the biggest jumps I had is when I hired, I hired Rachel Maza for a couple months to just be the operator behind the scenes. That's how I got the first mm -hmm. product out. That's how I got my website up. It's just, right. I have all these ideas that are, you know, in my head and, you know, I'm good at doing one thing at a time. I'm good at sitting down for a month and writing a promotion. I'm good at putting right. a course together, but then like oh, just keeping everything together is tough for me. I'm more on the creative side. It's just my personality. So right. yeah, like partnering with operators is, is I can see how that would be enormously beneficial.
yeah that's right it, it's a it's a huge huge um advantage to have so and then that's the i mean the other thing i think is is you know you get it, people tend to think about like performance in a bell curve like sure. a sort of traditional bell curve and i tend to think that the you know the the performance side, you know, for people and for um, performance and for like campaigns and direct mar- response, it, it's kind of like a flat line, and then you get a huge spike at the end. And mm-hmm. they're only you need for so if you're thinking about people, you need a couple, you know, you need a few heavy hitters. We're in that top five percent to make things really sing. And if you can find that that promotion or or, or two that is in that top performing level, it, it makes an enormous difference as well. It's funny. We were talking just before the call. I think it was before we started recording about uh, Gary Bensavinga and the person that came in. Yes. Uh, do you want to yeah. tell that? Like, like, So some people just, copywriters are occasionally the highest paid people in a company. If you have a big promotion, right. like I'm sure, you know, the, there was one or two years where Money Map alone paid me over seven figures. And I'm like, I'm sure I was making more money than some of the executives those years. Right, right. Um, but it makes yeah. sense. And then some people come in and they just, so what do you want to tell the, the that story? Sure. Sure. I mean, it, that, that story was in reference to um, kind of toward the end of my time at, at Rodale and it had been sort of a classic direct response business. And uh, they brought in a new CEO who was more traditional media and he came from Disney and he sort of, you know, the, he saw who the highest paid people in the company were. And he saw that with Gary Bensavenga and one or two other copywriters at the time, and that they were making more money than him. And it just like freaked him out. And he just, you know, he, he decided that all the royalties were going to get cut and you weren't, you know, you, you weren't going to pay these people nearly as much and et cetera, et cetera. And of course, then none of those people wanted to work with you anymore. So it, it would be like in a in any business thing, like, okay, um, you know, our, our top three sales guys, salespeople are making too much. Uh, let's just cut the, you know, let's get rid of them. And well, what do you think is going to happen to sales? <laughs> it's going to drop dramatically. And that, you know, that was unfortunately for, for Rodale, like the start of the uh, downward curve where it, that it never truly recovered from I, it, is, is making, you know, is cutting off the the people who are driving the, the most business. And I've seen it happen where people put their ego over their business, where it's some factor that uh, there's a couple people, <laughs> I was told in confidence, but I, so I won't say names, but there was one thing that they just would not do that it wasn't, it was a marketing related thing and it always works. And it, it it's a very common thing. It wasn't immoral, but they had some hold up in their head and they just would not implement it. And so their business never got past, I think like 1.5 million when they had a list of a hundred thousand or 200,000 people. And they just like, um, they wouldn't implement, well, I'll, I'll say they would never do an upsell. They thought it was immoral. And so they always made you enter your credit card information individually and for every purchase. And you're like, you're, they left so much money on the table because when the customer was hot and wanting to buy, they just thought it was immoral to offer them another thing. And it's it's a psychological holdup. There's nothing true about it. Sure. But some sure. people just can't get out of their own way. And paying your copywriters or top salespeople is one of those things. Some people right. can't do it. They can't imagine paying somebody, even if, if they made more money because of the copywriter, they couldn't get over the fact that it, it just wasn't fair in their eyes that this person was making more than them. So it's self sabotage, and I see it in a lot of businesses. No, that's true. It it, it can can definitely happen because you're, you, as you said, your ego can get in the way. So how do you deal deal with that if you come in? Because it's one of the things as a consultant, as I'm sure you're starting to see, business owners sometimes have some egos. Right. It, it can right your business has have egos, or or there's or there's company politics, or there's just been a there's an existing business model that that may or may not be working. Um, but because people have been attached to and into the business for so long, there's a reluctance to change, yeah. uh, and that's the um, that's often the 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 biggest hurdle is how do you you know how do you break that resistance down, and ultimately, you know, knowing the numbers and proving to them that the math works is is a critical step in that, and usually you have to you kind of have to step wise, step you know step into it too. Yeah. You know, that you you can't just say, well, we're going to blow up that entire business model and like <laughs> forget all the forget all you've been doing now. We'll go do something different and then, you know, test it out and, and implement it in steps um, to to help convince them as well. Because you you're always you oftentimes if, if you're sort of the, the, the person, you know, the 
whether it's a copywriter or a consultant or whatever coming in, you're going to have some champion in the company, mm -hmm. right? Who who wants to try to do this new things. You, and you may have people who are sort of skeptical or opposed to it. You have to work with that champion to understand a little bit about the dynamics and mm -hmm. what, what you need to convince them. And the, but, but again, the numbers are a huge help. It, it, it's hard to argue that if you're, if, if you do it this way and it makes more money, it's going to be bad for the business. Yeah. It's uh, the other thing that often works for me is presenting multiple ideas. So it's basically getting the client or the the person that's being the resistance to think it was their own idea. So you'll right. say, here's three options uh, that I've thought of and which one would you like? And one's obviously the right decision. And if they right. pick the wrong one, you say, well, why don't we test that against this one? But anyway, you make it sound like <laughs> it was their idea that and right. so then all of a sudden they're on board because you're they're picking the ideas and uh, and growing yes. things that way. Yes. Uh, there's some ego management where they know that you were there, but they felt a part of it. And that makes all the difference sometimes in smoothing the right. road down, or you know, having a smooth right. road a little bit down the uh, pike. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Uh, so when you're, what type of companies, I guess, are you consulting with right now? Right. What type of companies? Um, I mean, the, the, there's companies that I'm doing that are directly in the, in the direct response space or, you know, primarily there. And then there are one or two where I'm doing kind of just what you described, which is trying to bring some of the direct response principles into a business model that they already have, yeah. um, which in some ways for me is more fun yeah, uh, because it's a little more expansive and you're, you're teaching and everything else along, um, along with it. So it can, it can apply either way. Um, but I like to I like to think of what I'm I'm working with on people as sort of business growth consulting, because okay. um, you hear the term you, you'll see in, in job descriptions or whatever else like growth marketing <laughs> is is kind of a, a buzzword for hiring. And but oftentimes you read the detail and growth marketing is generally just like media, yeah. you know, is, is what it comes down to. It's it's Facebook, it's Google, it's social, it's whatever yeah you know, whatever other media the company wants to be in. And to me, business growth is more about the model itself, sure. about the components we discuss, which is you know the the product offering, the 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 way everything is positioned, how the numbers work, what your media channels are. And my you know my ideal client is to work with people who who want to examine all those things. Because you know, certainly, I can, I mean, hey, I can come in and I can work with you just on your marketing funnel, and that's fun. Or I can work on your, you know, I can copy chief things for you. I mean, I've done that for hundreds of million dollars of dollars worth of products over the years. And that's good too. But it, it's, you know, the, the best, best part is to actually get in there deep and, and kind of work with you on the business and how you can take some steps and identify those leverage points that are really going to expand it. Yeah. I think that's the thing that if I was to work with you, that would be the thing is like, you have all these years of experience in all these different industries. What are the actual leverage points? Like, let's actually get to the core of it. Uh, like, I'm sure you can make a big difference in my marketing funnel. But where your actual core talent would be is diving deep. Like, what's the big picture? How do you look at this over a, a two, three, four year horizon and say, all right, here's how we're going to get from, you know, seven figures to eight figures. The bigger picture type stuff is, uh, you know, you just have so much experience in different areas of operating direct response businesses that. Right. It's a hard answer to, to know, you know, coming in. Yeah, uh, I, I may I may be able to look at what you do online or something like that and have some initial thoughts. But until you dig into the numbers, you really don't know um, because you can't you can't say I can't tell you if it's definitely. Oh, we just have to work. You know, the, the key point here is the way your media works. And if we straighten that out, I think you can you can double the number of new customers you bring in. Or the the key point may be that your your product offering is too light. Right. And, you you know, if you build sort of some incremental off, incremental products onto that and you have uh, greater diversity of offers. You could double your lifetime value. You know, that that's I, I think it, it it's hard to say until you get in and, and dig in. But most of the time I would say it's gonna be it's gonna be on that product and offer side, or it's going to be in the 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 media conversion side. Yeah. So if people uh want to find out more about you or just get in touch, where where would you send them? Sure. I mean it's very simple. Bob Keppel at gmail.com is uh what I use and it's, you know, B-O-B-K-E-P-P-E-L. So pretty straightforward. Hopefully there are show notes. You can put that in there too, but. Um, Do you have a, a LinkedIn or social media profile you want to? Yeah, my and my LinkedIn, I was on early enough that it's straight up LinkedIn slash uh, Bob Keppel. All right. 
So uh, first adopter, huh? I was an early adopter. Yeah, that's right. Thanks to a friend who was sort of a, a business early <laughs> business school uh, <laughs> professor. He's like, I oh, have to try this. I'm like, okay. I can't even remember how long ago, how long ago it was. Nice. But, it's uh, yeah. all right. So I'll put uh, I'll, I'll I'll spell out your email so you don't get uh, too much spam <laughs> requests in the show notes. But I'll put a link to your to your LinkedIn. Um, and yeah. I, look, I really appreciate you coming on. We always have good conversations, whether it's uh, recorded or not. So I really appreciate this. And, you know, all the years we work together, it's uh, just great catching up again. No, it is. It is good. And and please do reach out. You know, I, I enjoy talking about people's businesses and learning about their businesses. So happy to happy to have conversations, even if it doesn't lead to any, you know, anything, uh, anything sort of deeper engagement. It's um, it's always fun to just kind of think through and talk through different types. All right. All right, Bob. Thanks so much for coming on. All right. Thanks, Henry. All right, everybody. Stay free.